Uh, and uh, my name is Hans Tömerik. I'm from Norwegian Institute for Nature Research in Tromsø. We have a department in Tromsø, but uh, main um, actually uh, the main main institute is located in in Trondheim in mid middle Norway. I have been working with remote sensing since 1983 and I went through a training session or training in, in France, in Toulouse in end of 83 and in the autumn. So, so um, more or less uh, I have been <laughs> in remote sensing quite uh, a bit of time and, and uh, maybe before some of you were born. So, so uh, I, I thanks, uh, many thanks to Lars. He, he went through the theoretical backgrounds and also had a very good uh, lecture on, on uh, time series. And uh, I think he went invented this PPI index that might be take over for the ordinary NDVI and EVI and other indices that uh, have been. But uh, actually, why do we use NDVI? I will go come back to that. And um, in uh, now, and uh, uh, first I will show you some examples of global monitoring using satellite uh, and, um, and I have more or less uh, participated in, in the different um, publications I will show you now for the next 10, 15 minutes. And, um, and uh, the first uh, paper I participated in was uh, uh, in Nature Climate Change in uh, 2013 about the temperature and vegetation seasonality diminishment over the northern lands. And uh, uh, in that actually uh, particular paper, we showed that the greening and productivity increased in the, uh, uh, yeah, from 32 to 39 percent of the Arctic and you see the Arctic uh, up here uh, I have uh, bring it in uh, where Tromsø is located and uh, uh, but uh, uh, actually Browning uh, showed only four percent less than four percent and uh, uh, was a more stable situ situation for 57 to 64 percent of the area, Arctic area. So, uh, but you, as you see, there is uh, quite an increase in parts of, of uh, Siberia and also parts of Northern America. And uh, uh, further, I will, uh, this is actually a schematic diagram showing how vegetation green affects climate via land atmosphere exchange so carbon water and exchange is uh, quite a good uh, diagram and uh, I have also uh, shared this presentation in the lecture folder so you can see for yourself and um, this is uh, actually um, from a uh, brand new uh, publication published by Shilong Piao from the uh, from Peking University and I was happy to be involved in that particular uh, publication. Um, so I, I don't go through this uh, but you see all these uh, uh, factors that contribute to greening effect, effects or, or to the climate and the, uh, 
actually also you see on the uh, down about the albedo that is going down because the greening is go going up and there are some photosynthesis respiration going up and photosynthesis going up and there are a lot of, 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 um, of, of uh, factors which uh, are increasing but also decreasing um, and uh, as I said, uh, the last uh, actually slide was from Nature Reviews, Earth and Environment Reviews, and called Characteristics, Drivers and Feedbacks of Global Greening, with uh, headed by Shiran Piao, but also contributed from uh, more or less the main, some of the main uh, or um, very important authors in, in remote sensing community like Philip Chiasis and Nemanja and Ranga Mineni. And uh, okay, and uh, there is another article in this on this slide. This, uh, it's about China and India lead in greening of the world through land use management. And I was also happy to be included that. But uh, in a way, this uh, manuscript took another way because actually we were uh, focused also on Arctic, but uh, all the Arctic people were thrown out <laughs> from the manuscript because we they um, they are uh, focused, uh, mean authors focused on, on uh, India and, and uh, China. So, uh, so, but I was we're still <laughs> along at the end of them. We, we, when we submitted this uh, paper. So, um, uh, first I will show you uh, one of the paper. On the left side is the trend in annual average leaf area uh, per decade from 82 to 2009 and this is leaf area index and um, and uh, this is actually access extracted from from the gims very coarse resolution uh, satellite data with a res special resolution of eight kilometers and based on the AVHRR satellites, actually the weather satellites. And that's why we also use uh, NDVI because you can't, there is only two bands that can be used and in order to, to extract NDVI. That's why NDVI still is in use because we can go back to 82. And uh, if you see on, on the left side, there is uh, 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 green areas and there is red areas, trend in annual average leaf area. There is some uh, areas that are experiencing um, decrease and uh, some areas that increase uh, the leaf area index. Going to the right, right side, uh, it's the trend in annual average from 2000 2017 and uh, as you see on that is actually based on the same but you see that uh, that um, the in for india and china you see that uh, it, there is a tendency to, to greening and uh, this, this is part more or less uh, due to different land use and increase in agriculture and forests in, in China and, and India. And you see also the change in leaf area for uh, China is uh, quite, ha has increased a lot from 2000 to 2017. And there are some also are, um, countries that 
actually has decreased like Indonesia due to to a reduction in the tropical forest there but also in Bra Brazil and indicated with the red colors yes and uh, this is uh, actually an uh, an increase in in uh, resolution of the same as you see here and here is the situation in india and and um, china as you see there is a quite increase in in um, greening of the vegetated array and here India is competing with China and you see Argentina is as a trend of, of, of uh, decreased leaf area index indicating that it's actually browning down there in in Argentina and Indonesia uh, and uh, Shen and my nanny who were um, co-authors of these two uh, articles I mentioned and they uh, have this uh, actually said this uh, satellite data and models show global warming could be 20 to 25 percent higher were it not for the carbon trapping and cooling effect of a greening earth during the past 40 years stopping deforestation and ecological sensible large-scale tree planting could be one simple but not sufficient defense against climate change so uh, so what they do in uh, parts of uh, Asia and also in Southern America with a lot of uh, forestry going on and clear cutting is uh, not good for the planet and uh, uh, as I said I, I was uh, actually <laughs> included in this because I provided some some uh, data from the Arctic and for instance from the Arctic coral area so time in in, in um, Siberia actually there is a decrease indicated in red here and this is due to the copper nickel smelter that emits about um, two million tons of sulfur dioxide uh, every year so uh, a lot of um, and that causing uh, effects on the vegetation it's going to it's uh, has um, actually more or less uh, been influenced over 30 to 40,000 square kilometers and and uh, in the inner part of the area there is a, uh, actually a forest dead so uh, so but the other places like uh, in Siberia there is an increase in the leaf area index um, uh, changes in the growing season duration and productivity uh, I was uh, also together with Tayin Park and Ranga Muneni and uh, Shilari Högda from Norut, Stenrune Carlsen who produced an article on the changes in growing season duration and productivity of northern vegetation inferred from long-term remote sensing data and uh, here um, actually I constructed a new uh, in index in a way growing season some and DVI it's not uh, new but uh, we published uh, we used that and also max and DVI and uh, it was published in environmental research letters in 2016 and as you see there is uh, uh, increase in uh, the trend of maximum NDVI in parts of, of uh, 
Siberia and also in, in Northern America. But there is also some browning co going on. And uh, uh, on the right side of the slide here is the, the, the trend in annual gross productivity. And um, uh, later this, this uh, afternoon, coming afternoon, we are having a mini workshop of upscaling. But uh, I, actually this is uh, based on course uh, satellite images like AVHRR and also MODIS. And actually here we are talking about not upscaling, but downscaling. Yeah, because we wanted to check what's go going on on the on the actually surface, and as you know, the MODIS, uh, for example, um, uh, and and uh, has a spatial resolution of two hundred fifty meters, and the GIMS data set has a resolution spatial resolution of eight kilometers, and you try uh, to, to <laughs> compare it with some, um, some uh, ground stations. But anyway, here is the growing season some NDVI. And as you see, the, there is uh, actually an increase from 82 to 2010. And there is uh, actually a, a, a drop in the, especially the tundra vegetation. And uh, that might be due, due to uh, some problems with the uh, spatial resolution. For example, snow. There is uh, some indication that, especially here in Trums and also other places, there are, uh, in a way, the, the start of um, some, some of the seasons, uh, spring season, have been delayed the last uh, decade. Um, but uh, I, I, I could tell you something. What did we actually try to, to compare it to this uh, actually uh, G as a growing season NDVI, some NDVI and the, G, the GPP from, uh, we tried to compare it with the uh, Fluxnet, actually, I the covariance towers around the world, and it was quite uh, quite tricky. But uh, um, but uh, as you see, there is a quite good R squared uh, correlation between the the satellite data or satellite based metrics and the ground stations uh, data from the Fluxnet. So uh, that's uh, actually an exam example of, of downscaling, not upscaling. So um, another ex example is based on the, on the um, NDVI 3G is the same as uh, based on the GIMPS data set. And um, from 82 to 19, and uh, as you see, there is uh, uh, the max NDVI and the time integrated NDVI during the, the, the period from 82 to 2019. And this is actually published in in, in Bulletin American Meteorological Society, this uh, this um, this uh, uh, summer, and uh, as you see, there are some areas that are are decreasing, and other areas. This is the pure Arctic. So, actually, for a uh, Svalbard, there is a spot in the actually in the inner ice fjord where Longyearbyen is uh, situated, there is uh, increased 
um, increased uh, max NDV and uh, NDVI, uh, time integrated NDVI. So, um, and this uh, actually, uh, this uh, maps are also going into the Arctic report card published by uh, NOAA in the United States. And uh, from the same, there is, uh, uh, this is uh, the same from including 2019. And there actually, as I said, uh, for the Arctic um, and Eurasia and North America for the Arctic, there is an increase the last two years. So there was a, for the time integrated NDV also for the, for the maximum NDV, there is some decline in the, in the greenness. So indicating that there, there is some browning, um, processing going on. Browning is uh, reduced production and also uh, that there are some problems with the vegetation, there is some deforestation and may, might be also some in the, like we have in, in, the, in the, there are some wild fires going on in the North America and Siberia, even also in the Arctic. Yes, and um, uh, also another example is uh, by Pierre Focal, etc. at all. Arctic green from warming promotes declines in caribou population. Actually, it was uh, published in, in uh, science advances and uh, uh, and uh, uh, also study back to 82 to 2011 in order to check um, how the caribou abundance or the population of caribou was affected by Arctic greening. And uh, here is uh, not from uh, America, but uh, here it's from Sweden and uh, a photograph, two photographs taken by Terry Callaghan uh, in, in Avisco. And you see the increase of, of, of uh, shrubs. And that's actually, a, and, for, and also some other uh, places for it. And, and um, that's uh, uh, an increase in uh, Northern America also. You see the shrubification going on. And um, there is, uh, actually this is, uh, I can send you a paper on that, but uh, as the population and spring plant biomass, uh, the relationship between the population size and climate warming and spring plant biomass and summer plant biomass, uh, what's going on in the population of the caribous. And uh, we also used NDVI, the, the, the old games data set. We used the caribou population growth and uh, the sea ice uh, concentration and, and uh, uh, from June to August, as you see the first uh, on the left side, the sea ice concentration um, was uh, on, um, decreased. And uh, when the sea ice concentration decreased and the uh, NDVI increased and the opposite when it sea ice concentration increased uh, uh, June, August, and the I decreased. And uh, that was also the same in a way with the population growth of, of uh, caribou. 
So, uh, and um, this is actually a, a model of the, and there was uh, actually a decrease in the populations of, of, uh, of uh, caribou. And one of the uh, big caribou herds in the eastern part of, of Canada actually decreased from 900,000 to 50,000 in the, from uh, the beginning of the 80s to uh, to be uh, in to 2011 12 so um, i will show you after this uh, um, speech a, a, a small video about that and uh, what was uh, actually what happened was that uh, this screening that uh, actually increased for the northern america alaska and canada and the polar and arctic areas uh, well, when it increased actually the population of caribou decreased and uh, we think that uh, that has to do to uh, the shrubification of, of, uh, of the tundra a lot of uh, areas that were were free of shrubs or no um, covered by shrubs and and um, this is shrubs are quite high it could be three four meters and very dense and and uh, and uh, uh, that is the main reason for that the population of, of caribou actually going down uh, and uh, another interpretation is that this this shrubification or the shrubs uh, like Petula glandulosa, Alnus viridis, they um, have a high content of resin. Resin is a poison, so that's why actually the reindeer or caribou actually avoid to go into this area because they know that they get poisoned and, and uh, so um, but also the uh with in the 80s and 90s the in, we had an increase in uh in the wolf and and um, pred predator population so they also went up so when the when the uh, caribou population went down then they they also uh hunted down the the Caribou. Um, uh, are there any um, questions about this uh, so far? I think um, uh, as uh, Lars, he, he actually he has uh, gone through the theoretical. So I'm uh, uh, so I'm only. Uh, uh, present things uh, or publication that actually are based on NDVI and other indices. So uh, are there any questions about so far? Because now I will concentrate on Svalbard. I will not concentrate so much about Fenoscania, Norway, Sweden and Finland, but uh, mainly on Svalbard. So I can uh, go. Seems not to be any questions. Um, uh, I can also send you uh, the publication to you if you want. You have, I think, you have my my email address, so I can uh, can send you some of the publications that are 
I had pre uh, published so on, on that more global, but also the coming up presentations from Svalbard. Um, now I go into the field-based observation and measurements done on Svalbard and in in Arctic. And uh, actually, we have had different uh, studies going on uh, in the Longyearbyen area, where UNIS and, and SIOS is uh, situated. And uh, we had, um, together with the Polish Research Institution, we had actually uh, seven sites from the inner part of uh, Alventown to the inner part of Björndalen. So um, I will uh, present some of the, uh, actually what we actually do on in the field. And we, uh, on Svalbard, we have concentrated on climate-induced injury and damage on plant species. And we also uh, uh, published uh, studies on trampling from tourism but not uh, actually from Longyearbyen area, but other places on Svalbard, like Nyolesund and the uh, upper northwest area of Svalbard. Uh, but uh, what we also found out was that the pollution from the mining is uh, quite huge in the uh, long in BNR area, but also in New Lesson. So actually, many of the studies going on in Svalbard are situated in, in um, pretty uh, high polluted areas. So that uh, so we should actually find the uh, areas that are not so polluted, and uh, we have a uh, we have a cooperation with. Um, with um, the Polish guy starting this year in Hunsun, but uh, uh, due to the COVID, they couldn't go there. So next year, we, uh, we try to go to Hunsun because there is an area there is not so much pollution. It's uh, maybe some lo long transported pollution by air, but not the local pollution from the mining, all the mines situated in New Orleans and Longyearby. And uh, one of the articles we uh, published together with uh, uh, with uh, the Polish guys, but also with all the people in Norway and and uh, and. Uh, United Kingdom was the understanding drivers of extensive plant damage in boreal and Arctic ecosystems. And this was, uh, see, we had a study area in Svalbard and, 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 and uh, northern Norway. And uh, actually what we did on the ground was to, to um, observe or measure the damage ratios or, or, or uh, uh, that was a combination of pollution, but also climate. And Cassiope tetragona is one of the dwarf shrubs and also the Rias octopetala is a small plant, dwarf shrub in, in, and you see that we had a quite high damage ratio of Cassiope, uh, Tetragon, and Rhea Soctopetala, these uh, two species in the years 2014 and 2015. And, and um, that means that more or less they were killed by, by um, uh, climatic events during uh, the winters, like rain and snow events and climate. Uh, warming periods. And um, uh, we also did some uh, spectrometer measurements and we see that there was uh, different 
and uh, spectral reflectance uh, in, in the, the different sites and uh, on the right side you see uh, killed Cassiope tetragona in gray so much of the might be 40 50 percent of the area of Cassiope tetragona was killed by by um, by uh, winter warming events actually uh, pre uh, warming and freezing and then uh, that is uh, events that especially Cassiope tetragona do not tolerate I simply die and we have the same problem with Kaluna vulgaris um, on the coast of Norway actually they can be killed during winter due to, to warming and freezing episodes during winter and that's due to climate warming and you see um, uh, this is also uh, occurring in Alaska uh, in Alaska we saw that in uh, in, in um, Denali Highway and uh, but also in Svalbard on the Cassiope so uh, so um, uh, in both species Cassiope in in uh, Alaska also too so we have because we have the same same species all around the Arctic area polar area and it seems that <laughs> in a way there was a fire going on in in the empetum here but it's killed by 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 uh, warming episodes during winter because um, Mount McKinley or Denali mountains uh, range they have these warming periods during uh, winters too not only in Svalbard so um, uh, this is actually what we do in field we have some actually measure with uh, uh, NVI sensors we measure with uh, uh, the respiration and the CO2 exchange by using uh, um, different equipment we, we use also full content measures and etc yeah, so we have a lot of instruments uh, with, uh, with, with us in the field in order to to try to to um, observe what's going on uh, in the in the field on the surface and uh, uh, what we do uh, then we try to upscale it to to satellites or to UAVs uh, or unmanned uh, vehicles or uh, drones uh, and to aircrafts uh, sensor on aircrafts and and to and up to satellites and or in order to to show or if this um, browning events we see on the surface also is uh, apparent in the wider landscape or other places of Svalbard or other places of the polar area. Uh, 